Hello, and welcome to our third and final episode of Fire on the Mountain. Tonight, we'll be looking at the future of the Catalinas. My name is Vanessa Barchfield. I'm science and environment producer at Arizona Public Media. On behalf of the Arizona Institutes for Resilience, the Desert Laboratory on Tumamoc Hill, Arizona Public Media, and all our panelists and partners, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm honored first to introduce our special guest host for the evening, Tucson Mayor Regina Romero, who will set the stage for our conversation tonight. Mayor Romero, hello and welcome. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Fire on the Mountain, the Future of the Catalinas, the third in this series. Before I begin, I want to thank the University of Arizona for hosting the series and bringing together various experts to look at this significant and dramatic event in our community, one that affects us all in many ways. A special thank you to the panelists and moderator, Vanessa Bargefield, for sharing their valuable time with us this evening. I would also like to thank Sarah Smallhouse, one of our many wonderful community members, for sponsoring this webinar. And thanks to all of you for taking the time this evening to attend the webinar. In October of last year, I had the opportunity to participate in a community workshop hosted by U of A President Bobby Robbins. Attendees included university leaders and faculty, personnel from the city and county, and community organizations. We discuss ways to work together to arrive at real solutions to some of the challenges we must address in the face of environmental shocks. I am grateful for the amazing partnership with the university, an institution that has always been an anchor for our community. This webinar demonstrates the university's commitment to serve the entire region and engages in discussions about issues that are important to all of us. A very dedicated team led by U of A's Dr. Ben Wilder, the director of the Desert Laboratory at Tumamoc Hill, pulled this event together in very unique and difficult times, and I want to thank them all for a job well done. The Catalina Mountains, traditional lands of the Tohono O'odham people, are an anchor for Tucsonans. They are a place where everyone can retreat to, enjoy nature, hike, birdwatch, hunt, ski, look at the stars, and enjoy the amenities of Summerhaven. They bring a sense of place to our city. The Catalinas are a living laboratory for studying and adapting to climate change, and this webinar will provide key information for how our mountain has been affected and how it will change. Thanks again to everyone who made this webinar series possible. It has been an example of how we can harness the expertise of our community to review the past, talk about the present, and how we impact the future. The Catalinas have been a haven for people of Chukchan for millennia and will continue to be for generations to come. Um, we'll go to Dr. Ben Wilder, um, who runs the Desert Laboratory on Tumamoc Hill. Ben, are you there? Sure am. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, I know I, for one, have sure learned a lot through the first uh, two episodes. And so we're going to uh, try to bring it up into the future this evening and to focus on what is the future of the, of the Catalina is going to look like and really trying to get a sense of the, the places that we love, that we go to, that are, um, you know, kind of our refuges in, in town. Are they, what are they going to look like as we, as we move forward? So I just want to take a second to also thank all the individuals that have been uh, making this series possible. Uh, and one person that hasn't been mentioned yet is our executive producer, Roseanne Hansen of the Desert Laboratory, who's been really pulling the strings behind the scenes, uh, facilitator Maya Patterson, Anna Seifer Lee Valencia, and Amanda Lindberger, who all have been making this happen. Um, uh, and I also, the special collaboration we're having with Arizona Public Media has really raised the level of what we're being able to accomplish in this. So Vanessa, thank you for being with us. And Tom, thank you for also, um, Tom McNamara for doing the first two episodes. And uh, this all wouldn't have started, honestly, if it weren't for uh, the uh, ingenuity and the idea of Sarah Smallhouse, um, who not only came up with the idea, but was able to help to provide seed funding for this. So at that, um, I think we'll, Vanessa, I'll kick it back to you and we can get into tonight's show. 
All right, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that just, you know, I feel so lucky that about a week before the Bighorn Fire started, actually, I went for a, an amazing hike in, on the Aspen Trail, and, and I'm just so grateful um, that I had that time and, and that, that, you know, that opportunity to connect with the, with the place before it was so changed. Um, tonight's episode is actually all about change and resilience. Some of the questions we'll be asking are, how will the ecological processes and species of the Catalinas rebound or not from the effects of the Bighorn Fire? And what are the projections for the future of the Catalinas and what role can and should restoration play? Our panelists have been researching the long-term effects of fire in the Skylands for decades. They'll share insights gained from careful study that allows us to look into the future and find solutions to restore the landscape if it's possible and mitigate the challenges ahead. Future actions will be broad and tonight we'll focus on how you in the audience can get involved with local organizations in monitoring and restoration efforts. Uh, before you get before we get started, I know that you're all probably experts at Zoom by now, but just in case, uh, go over a few tips for our viewers. I'll ask you to use the Q&A area. There's a button at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit your questions for the panelists this evening. The Q&A with our panelists will be at the end of the episode, and we'll try to choose a broad cross-section of questions. Uh, a note that this episode is being recorded and will be posted in about a day on the Arizona Institutes for Resilience website in case you want to watch it again or send it to anyone that you think might be interested. Now I'll introduce our first panelist. Dr. Don Falk is professor in the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. Hi, Don. Evening. Pleasure uh, to be here. Hello. Um, Don's research areas include fire history, fire ecology, restoration ecology, landscape ecology, and the impacts of land management and global change on ecosystems, including dynamics of abrupt change. Don, uh, your research career has been very much about the fire, fire ecology of the Southwest Sky Island mountain ranges. Can you define for us what exactly uh, Sky Island is and where are they located geographically? Sure, so thanks for the privilege of being here. Um, I wanted to set a little bit broader context for the Bighorn Fire in relation to our unique bioregion. And I would say that whether you're a Tucson native or just moved here, it probably doesn't take long to realize just how unique our bioregion is. We live in one of a handful of Sky Island regions in the entire world. Uh, and these all have unique properties that are very different from other kinds of mountain ranges. So here at low elevations from east and west are desert, deserts and grasslands feel the influence of the Chihuahuan and Sonoran deserts respectively. And are then at higher elevations our forests feel the biological affinities of the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Madre. So we are receiving biological and also human and climatological influences from all these directions. Very, very few places in North America hold the biological riches that we see here. The forest of Rocky Mountains and the Colorado Plateau and the forest of the Sierra Madre meet here and intermingle. We also have our unique Madrean Encinal woodlands, which are, are a truly unique property uh, of this area, and not only in terms of vegetation, but in terms of how fire is expressed. So when we talk about wildland fire, it's important to realize that fire is something that an ecosystem does. It's not something that falls from the sky like a hurricane or a tornado. Fire is ecosystem behavior. And so naturally you would imagine that because of the unique aspects of our sky island bioregion biota, our forests and woodlands and deserts, fire takes a unique expression here. And it's also regulated, of course, by our unique monsoon fire uh, regime, which um, perhaps this year we're all waiting a little impatiently for it to actually do what it's supposed to do, depending where you live. But the monsoon absolutely regulates our fire regime in very important ways. So regardless of how you look at it, when big fires happen here, like the Bullock and Aspen fires in 2002 and three, or the Bighorn fire, it's going to be a unique Sky Island fire event. And 
Don, in March, the University of Arizona launched the new Arizona Institutes for Resilience, whose mission is to develop solutions to the environment and society. Let's take a step back and just talk about what this, this word resilience actually means and how the Catalinas may or may not be resilient in the face of uh, the Bighorn Fire and, of course, other agents of, of major change. Right. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to have a resilient ecosystem? Ecosystems have to tolerate a lot of stress like wildfires and heat waves, droughts, insect outbreaks, disease, major storms. There's really quite a long list of, of stressful environmental conditions or episodes that um, uh, ecosystems have to tolerate. And scientists have come to understand ecological resilience in a way that's different from the way we think about it in our own bodies. The first is similar. It's the ability to tolerate stress, like a ponderosa pine that has thick bark to withstand the heat of a wildfire. The second component of resilience is the ability for a population to recover after there's been mortality, such as you're seeing here on the screen. The trees may have been killed, but after that mortality, there's recruitment, and so the forest can regrow. The last component, though, is called reorganization or transition, and it's the way that resilience is really different for ecosystems because, as you see here on this slide, you could start with a forest, and it may cycle to remain a forest, to grow back as a forest after a fire, but it also may convert into something completely different, a shrubland or a grassland. And here's the thing, that is not necessarily a disaster or a unique property. In fact, all of the ecosystems that we see around us that we think have been there forever are actually the result of transitions like this that happened sometime in the past. Maybe it was in the middle of the Holocene. Maybe it was at the end of the last ice age. Maybe it was when indigenous peoples and the fire that they brought to the landscape were removed from the landscape. But in one way or the other, these forests and these ecosystems have been going through transitions all the time. And so the fact that we're seeing it now happen makes us uncomfortable because we think, oh, that shouldn't be a, a gamble oak landscape like we saw there. That's supposed to be something else. We really have to disengage ourselves from thinking that everything in nature stays the same. We see a lot of change around us. Here are some slides that I took on the uh, looking at the fire effects of the Bighorn Fire. Here we are in that lower pine oak and most of the pines have survived. A lot of the oaks seem to be dead, but they're gonna bounce right back. They're very fire resilient. Um, and so uh, that's a system that we would think of being very resilient in the sense of bouncing right back. But then you get up into the higher elevation and the conifer zones and you see some areas that were already type converted from forest to shrubland during the Aspen and Bullock fire. And then in the background, we're seeing a lot of areas now with uh, conifer trees that have been killed and they may or may not recover. There may or may not be recovery. But in the meantime, other species like bracken fern is having a field day. And many of the early successional species like Gamble, uh, like Gamble Oak, New Mexico Locust, and Bracken are coming in to occupy that space. The last thing I'll say here is that the local organizations like the Sky Island Alliance do an amazing job and they give us huge opportunities for us all to help with the healing process after we have a big fire. Um, and of course, as you know, change is constant and is happening all around us all the time. Um, but there are certain benchmarks that can serve as baselines for understanding and setting conservation and management goals. Can you help us understand the concept of shifting baselines and how ecosystems shift over time? Mm -hmm. So uh, a good example for me of shifting baselines would be the bison herds that dominated most of Central North America Nobody alive ever saw those when they were present. We've forgotten that they were an integral part of the functioning of that ecosystem. Um, and so in many ways, we know what we've seen uh, during our own lifetimes or maybe through photographs. We think that, oh, this should always, this has always looked like the way I saw it when I was 12 years old and hiking through it. And that may or may not be true. And in fact, it's probably the case that that just represents one point in a long trajectory of change. The problem, though, with the shifting baseline is people get used to 
uh, altered conditions. For example, people who study the sociology of climate change are really concerned that people will just accommodate to our new conditions instead of realizing how drastically altered they are. And so the shifting baseline represents both a way to see nature, but it's also something we have to look out for because we may miss really important changes that have um, that have happened. I should mention, by the way, that uh, the uh, at the University of Arizona, both through the Arizona Institute of Resilience and Center for Climate Adaptation and Solutions in Science, we're working with managers very closely to try to join these ideas of resilience and adaptation to what managers have to do on the ground. Very challenging job. And what lessons are important to draw from other sky islands in the region and historic or recent fires that have occurred in those areas? Well, so as we'll see from our other uh, speakers, each mountain range recovers in its own way, depending on the unique properties of the, uh, the biota, the flora that lived there, and also the properties of the fire, how long ago it was, what the climate was during the period of recovery. You know, if you had a fire that was in 2000, you were faced with a good 10 years of severe drought. That's a very challenging time for tree seedlings to recover. And so recovery is really slow compared to big fires that happened in the 80s or 90s when recovery was much faster because the climate was more favorable. So I would say that the, the, the real lesson, although there are some general principles, the real lesson is that you really have to get down literally on your hands and knees and understand what's going on from the ground up in order to understand how resilience actually works. And how do you do that? I mean, are you, are, what are some of the things that you might look at in order to, 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 to measure that sort of resilience of um, an ecosystem? Yeah, yeah. Well, a colleague of mine once said that without soil, there's no resilience. And, and she was absolutely right. Uh, so we look very closely at, at the, what the soil likes, like, looks like after a fire. Sometimes soils can be very, very severely damaged. And a lot of ecologists like myself for a long time make the mistake of thinking that plants just begin at the ground surface and, and extend up. And obviously, in many respects, you know, half the plant, half of its function is below ground where we really have to remember, oh yeah, we got to look down there. So soils are certainly critical. Another factor that's really important is the landscape structure that follows a big fire. And when I say structure, I mean you have big high severity patches like the one that we saw in the slideshow earlier. That was a 10,000 acre patch with not a single living tree. What that means for resilience is that there's no source of seeds to recolonize that area unless people pack them in and, and plant them. But in terms of natural dispersal, it could take literally centuries just for the first wave of seeds to reach those severely burned areas. So we look not only at the kind of micro pattern of what's happening with soil and um, nearby, nearby uh, forest, but we also look at the, the structure and spatial structure of the landscape. And in the Bighorn Fire, of course, one of the big concerns is, are we going to have these big, large, contiguous patches where it could take decades for seeds to get back into the, into the forest and begin that process of recovery? And lastly, if you would just talk a little bit about how we might look at Mexico's Sierra Madre as a way to compare the skylines of Southern Arizona. Right. So I will just say to uh, any of the 464 people who are on this webinar, if you haven't been down to see the Sierra Madre, get yourself down there. It's a spectacular region. Several of the, you'll be, if you get up into some of the Mexican sky islands, it will feel like home. And of course, the lesson here is that the border is really a non-existent human artifact, that the, the, the sky islands of Mexico are every bit like the sky islands of Arizona. In fact, roughly half of them are there. And as you go further south, you get into the extraordinary biological riches of Mexico. The interesting thing about Mexican forests is that they haven't had fire suppressed to the extent that fires have been suppressed here in the United States. So if we look at fire scars in the tree ring record, for example, we can go back many hundreds of years and we see almost identical fire behavior in many in the Sierra Madre and the Mexican Sky Islands, almost identical up until about 1900. 
And then fire frequency in the American side falls off a cliff because we built railroads, we had tens of millions of grazing animals, the elimination of the indigenous peoples, who pretty much the fire regime stopped. But in Mexico, it kept going. You can go into fire into sky islands and parts of the Sierra Madre today, and you will see the same kind of fire behavior that we would have seen here historically. So in a, on top of everything else, the forests and mountains of Mexico are an incredible laboratory for what our forest could look like. Wow, well, they sound beautiful. Um, thank you so much, Don, for your time. And we'll, of course, chat more during the Q&A section of uh, tonight's conversation. Great, Next thank up, you. thanks. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Jim Malusa, a research scientist at the University of Arizona School of Natural Resources and the Environment. He specializes in vegetation mapping and ecology, including post-wildfire vegetation change. Um, Jim, welcome. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, one of the important aspects of understanding the impacts of fires over time is seeing changes unfold over years and, in fact, longer, I mean decades. Can you describe the technique of repeat photography for studying those changes? Oh, for sure. Repeat photography is really simple. I mean, that's a great thing about it. I mean, you just go to where a picture was taken previously and you take another one. The, uh, of course, I mean, anyone can do it, but you want to be as close as possible to the original camera position. And on top of that, because uh, light and shadows is so important, Photography, you want to go there at about the same time of year and most importantly at the same time of day. So repeat photography as a tool of science got going in the 1800s, not long after photography itself was invented. The, uh, and the very first use of it was for tracking glaciers, the movement of glaciers in the Alps. The uh, people wanted to know were the glaciers coming, were they going, and how fast was that happening. And repeat photography was just perfect for doing that. Now, here at the U of A, uh, we were pioneers in the use of repeat photography to document not glaciers, but vegetation change. And Dr. Homer Schantz, uh, a botanist here, who eventually became the president of the university, he went to Africa in 1918 and made a vegetation map. And he took lots and lots of photos, and he had lots and lots of notes. And then he went back 40 years later and re-photographed all the same spots. The, uh, and this method was repeated, more or less, uh, for the American Southwest by Ray Turner and uh, Rod Hastings, the, uh, except they didn't take the first set of photos. They used historic photos that they dug up. And then they had landmarks that they could go back and figure out where that was. And then they took, they did that for 97 photos, and they did 97 photos of their own. And they matched them and made this wonderful book published in 1965 by the university. It's called The Changing Mile. The, uh, I'm lucky enough to get my start with repeat photography with Ray Turner, Dr. Turner, about 30 years ago on field trips. And so here at the U of A, I'm just one repeat photographer in a long, long chain, 100 years of repeat photographers. And are you using repeat photography to track forest recovery after wildfires like the Bighorn? Yes, exactly. Well, 10 years ago, the, uh, I made a vegetation map of the Chiricahua Mountains, and they're about 100 miles to the southeast of here. A lot like the Catalinas, they're very big, 9,000 feet, and the map shows the different ecosystems that are at different levels, elevations on the mountain. You saw such a map in color, it looked like concentric rings, and the, the big ring at the bottom would be grasslands, desert grasslands that surround the mountain, and the bullseye at the top would be the, the pine and fir. The, uh, now, while I'm making this map, I took a bunch of photos, the, uh, and I took a bunch of notes, and I wrote down who lived where, it's mostly oak there, it's mostly pine over there. And then the very next year, uh, 2011, the whole mountain caught on fire. The, uh, and, and I had nothing to do with that, the, uh, but I thought, well, this is a really good chance to go in and start matching photos. And so I'd go back every two years, and I'd take photos of the very same spots. The, uh, this, is, of course, is exactly what I want to do for the Bighorn Fire. But I think it's best if we first take a look at four different photo sites, four different places in the Chiricahuas, and see what happened over the last decade to give us a hint of what's to come. Now, this is a picture of the fire in the Chiricahuas from the International Space Station. And let's go now to a photo site that's up quite high. 
over 9,000 feet, Santea Point. This is just like the elevation of Mount Lemmon. You'd see the same species. This is Gamble's Oaks, those trunks in the foreground, and there's little specks of brightness in the back are Aspen. The, uh, they're both resprouters, and they're gonna be called to resprout very soon because the fire roars through, kills them all. The oak come roaring back. The, uh, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. <clears throat> the trunks start toppling with time. And then there are so many oaks now I had to step forward to show you the aspen that's there now. And you can see the big conifers in the back. Now those big conifers are not resprouters. They, they have cones and seeds that fall down with every year, but they have not reestablished themselves in the, the burn zone itself nearby, probably because the, the uh, gambles oak and the aspen got such a head start on them. This is common though in this ecosystem. It's probably gonna come back pretty much exactly like it was before. At Rustler Park, we see an area that's mostly pine, and, and this is very similar to what you'd see at Rose Canyon in the Catalinas or at Palisades Ranger Station. Notice all the logs on the ground. Those are all from the 1994 rattlesnake fire in the Chiricahuas. And here comes the fire now. All those logs get vacuumed up. They're gone. The, uh, notice in the background, those big trees. The recruits that you saw in 2010 are, are dead, but now they're back again because they have those trees behind as a, as a seed source. As Dr. Falk said, it's important that you have a seed source nearby. And this really doesn't look that much different than what it did in, in 2010. A little further down the mountain at 6,000 feet, we have a good example of Madran pine oak. Got a nice yucca there. And lots of pines. These pines, though, are a different one. They're called Apache pine. They have very, very long needles, and they're only uh, from the Chiricahuas and further south in the Sierra Madre. So there is no analogous ecosystem in the Catalinas. The fire kills almost all of those pines. The, uh, but instead of, of, um, of aspen or something, there's what happens here is another species that wasn't here previously. It's called Ceanothus buckbrush has taken over. The, uh, and the whole back slope there especially is completely covered with ceanothus and there hasn't been any recruitment of pine. The, uh, so this is possible tipping point. It could just stay like this. A little bit further down slope is Pinery Canyon. Those tall pines in the background are Chihuahuan pines. If you want to see these in the Catalinas, you would go up to Bear Canyon at the Chihuahua Pine Picnic Ground. The, uh, there's also Manzanita in here. And, uh, and what's going to happen is a high severity fire is going to come through and kill every single tree there. And but very rapidly, the uh, manzanita come back. They have special seeds that don't germinate until they're motivated by fire. And here is the situation now. The, the pine trees, even though you have no scale there, take my word for it, those are about 10 feet high already. And that's because this pine is a very, very special pine. So the, uh, if it's burned, it will sprout, re-sprout. That's unique the, uh, among pine trees. There's like 100 species of pines in, in the world, and only three of them are like that. So places that were dominated previously by Chihuahuan pine, I, I think they're going to come back pretty quick. Wow. Those images are really striking. Thanks for, for bringing those. Um, are you using the the technique of repeat photography in the Catalinas to track fires. Um, do you already have sites in, in place where you have a camera? Well, I, I will use repeat photography for sure, just like I did in the Chiricahuas. The, uh, and I'm gonna use uh, sites that I had previously to make a, uh, another ecosystem map. The, uh, and so they look a lot alike, these two maps, except with one big difference that between the Chiricahuas and the Catalinas, and that is in the Chiricahuas, there were no places with saguaros and no places with Palo Verdes. There's no Sonoran Desert ecosystem because it's just too cold. The, uh, and this is really a big deal when we're talking about fire uh, because plants in the Chiricahuas from top of the mountain to the bottom, they all evolved with fire. They've all got adaptations to that. They got thick bark, they re-sprout. But when you come to the Sonoran Desert that we have in the Catalina Mountains, the, uh, they, uh, the selective pressure there was to survive drought. And so you can see this in the green skin of saguaros and in Palo Verdes, right? They do their photosynthesis through their epidermis, through their, through their bark. The, uh, 
But if you're going to let the sun in through your skin, you're super vulnerable to fire. The plants that, well, not every desert plant is like that. Some like big dieta grass or bush muley, they're desert grasses that will re-sprout after a fire. But those grasses never, never become common enough to carry a fire through a landscape. And that's not the case with exotic buffalo grass or fountain grass, the, uh, both of which are capable of moving in and frankly killing our native species like brittle bush. The, uh, I mean, you'd think the hard working native species of the Sonoran Desert would come out on top, but that's not always the case. The, uh, now, it takes a while for this to happen 10, 20, 30 years. The, the buffalo grass can move in and take over. The, uh, once it covers more than half the mountain, you get situations like you're seeing here. This is the Mercer fire that happened last year. The, and uh, the, it was happened during a monsoon, and so it didn't cover very much ground, 25 acres, but the, the toll was significant on the saguaros the, uh, and on the Palo Verdes, and you can see the buffalo grass comes right back. The, uh, now, what about the rest of the Catalinas? I found some very old photos. There's one here at, at Kellogg Mountain that was taken in 1912, and it's pretty unique because because it, there, there are stumps that shows that this used to be a pine forest. The, uh, and uh, I went back you now 100 years later, and it's still not a pine forest. So some places get changed, and they never come back. Other places are very resistant. Like this is the wilderness of rocks in the Catalina Mountains. And this is a very patchy place, and it's got a lot of rocks. And the fires never get very common there, or very high severity, I should say. This is Pima Saddle in the Catalina Mountains. Look at all the oaks all the uh, yuccas. This is a kind of very resilient landscape typically and uh, and I would expect all these re-sprouting species to come back fairly quickly and, and in general the lower you go down on the mountain the faster things happen because the growing season is, is longer. And so what do you <laughs> anticipate to see in the coming years um, in our Catalinas? Oh boy that's kind of a a scary question, hard to answer. You got to be pre predicting things. You know, so much depends on the on the weather. The uh, and the Chiricahuas and the Catalinas everywhere. It's a, it's plain to see that the higher you go, the wetter it is. The uh, and that means you got pine trees at the top and cactus down low. But the uh, just as important is when the rain comes. The uh, and so in southern Arizona, our pattern of rain is bimodal comes in the winter, comes in the summer, the droughts between. And uh, if you have a map, like you see here, where the summer rain areas are in red and the winter are in blue, you can see a strong pattern in the state from summer rain in southeastern Arizona. It's going toward getting much more winter rain in Phoenix and toward California. The, uh, now, failure of the summer rains, which is, seems to be happening right now, the, uh, that could mean the end of some species which are dependent on, on summer rain. A good example of that might be pinyon pines. And they're little twisted, picturesque pine trees that you see at Windy Point. They're a summer rain species. They're at the very edge of their range. Those rains poop out, they'll probably be replaced just by manzanita and you'll end up with an ecosystem that's more like chaparral, the kind of thing you'd see in central Arizona. Of course, one summer though doesn't make a pattern. And uh, the point is that some species are, are already at the edge of their range and they're, they're close to, we could easily lose them. So, I mean, so hold on to your memories of the Catalinas and take a lot of photographs because I can use them later. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, um, for your time tonight, Jim. And um, once again, we'll hear from you more in just a bit. Uh, next up, we have Louise Mistal. Uh, Louise is the executive director of the Sky Island Alliance, a community conservation organization based in Tucson. Hi, Louise. Thanks for joining us um, and for bringing the community perspective to the Bighorn Fire issue. First of all, let's just start at square one. Um, what does the Sky Island Alliance do? Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. And thanks to the organizers for putting this series together and the opportunity to speak tonight. I've been really enjoying it and learning a lot from my colleagues and I certainly hope everyone tuning in is as well. So Sky Island Alliance is a conservation organization that works to protect and restore the diversity of life and lands in the Sky Island region of the US and Mexico. And Don gave us a great overview of what Sky Islands are and the region. So thanks for that, Don. And 
of course, they're our home here in Tucson. So this is a, a special place in the world where an amazing diversity of wildlife and plants live. And the Sky Islands provide for our quality of life here with clean air, uh, birds, butterflies, jaguars, and plants that we know and love, open space that we love to hike in, like you were just speaking about this evening, and of course, flowing water. The Santa Catalinas are part of our watershed here in Tucson, which is really important uh, when we think about the Bighorn Fire and conservation. And if you're like me, especially this time of year, we've been talking about the monsoon failing and the heat. Um, you love visiting the high elevation tree pines of the Catalinas and other sky islands to get a change of scene from our beautiful but hot Sonoran desert. So Sky Island Alliance is working to connect people to this amazing place, people like all of you, um, to conserve wildlife and the space they need to roam, to protect water sources and bring them back to flowing health where they need some help from humans. And we also build the science and the large landscape collaboration needed to protect this special region. A big part of our work is engaging the community as volunteers, uh, both in collecting science and in reviving the land through restoration. So hundreds of volunteers contribute thousands of hours of work each year with Sky Island Alliance to track wildlife movement with remote cameras, install rock work uh, to heal erosion, like what we're already seeing following the Bighorn Fire, survey spring ecosystems and restore them to flying health, and to plant native plants to bring back food and shelter for hummingbirds and butterflies and other critters like that fun skunk we saw running around in the grasslands. And tell us more about the science you use to gauge the impact of those restoration efforts. Yeah, so science is an important part of our work and we're fortunate um, to have great partners like the, the University of Arizona scientists we've been hearing from um, the last couple episodes. And we use science to choose restoration locations. So we need to know what's at stake in a place. Information like where are springs and how much water is at them. Where are wildlife moving and finding reliable water. And where are the places that are most important for sustaining a diversity of plants and animals and also likely to be resilient into the future. And we use science to develop the restoration approaches that you were seeing some photos of, like planting plants and installing erosion control structures. Uh, the restoration structures you were seeing in previous photographs are rock detention structures that are low tech and can be installed by volunteers. And they're really just rocks arranged across a drainage that slow the, the movement of water and create a kind of water bank that keeps water flowing through the watershed for longer after rains. And we know these structures are effective and how best to use them thanks to some local science from the USGS here in Tucson and their arid lands water harvesting study. And then as has been mentioned, overlaying on all of this is climate change, which is affecting how much water is available on the landscape, how hot and dry things are, and how large and severe wildfires are. So we use climate science and work with the expert community of natural resource managers here in Southern Arizona to develop strategies to help our treasured natural areas and wildlife adapt to climate change. And in many cases, as Don and others in previous episodes talked about, conditions have changed such that it will take a lot of human intervention or may actually not be possible to restore ecosystems to what was previously there. And they're constantly changing. So I, I, this isn't about science, but I want to acknowledge that for me, and I'm sure many of you um, tuning in, this is a hard reality to deal with emotionally. As someone who loves the pine forests and the Catalinas, I'm certainly grieving <laughs> over the loss of some of the forests that will not return in my lifetime. But I take solace in the fact that even in the face of a hotter, drier world, uh, these dramatic changes fires bring to our mountains we can still help sustain a diversity of plants and animals if we work to heal, heal the landscape from erosion and loss of plants and protect vital water sources and really importantly ease transition for wildlife and ecosystems. And um, importantly, we can anticipate future impacts from fire and take action now that will help lessen impacts uh, when ecosystems experience fire in the future. Um, 
because fires are typically extinguished by monsoon rains, like we've talked about, they can cause dramatic erosion. But if we anticipate future fires and put structures in place now to slow runoff and rain, future rainfall events, um, we can make a difference, even though these events are going to continue to happen. And we've done this work in the Chiricahua Mountains to restore a Tex Canyon watershed, which burned in the Horseshoe 2 fire, and to anticipate fire effects in the Barboo watershed, which was unburned, but is at high risk for high severity fire in the future. And um, I'm gonna have to move on to the next question. I wanna talk about restoration. What's actually possible in terms of restoration in these kinds of big, you know, drastic situations like we saw in the Bighorn Fire? Yeah, so I'll take us on a short field trip to the Chiricahua Mountains, which Jim was also talking about, um, to see an example of what's possible, where we've installed uh, rock detention structures, and then back to the Catalinas to talk about springs. Um, a couple of uh, Big issues following wildfire are erosion of soils, um, which you can see in, in these videos, or sorry, in the photographs here of um, the upper Tex Canyon watershed, some of these erosive uh, features on the landscape coming in. And then another big issue following wildfire is the potential loss of spring ecosystems where fire burns over them and, and they may become silted in uh, from erosion. So we can install uh, these rock detention structures I've been talking about to slow water down as it flows across the landscape. They allow sediment to fall out and stay in place behind the structures. And they create these wonderful microhabitats that you see at the bottom of your screen there um, that are storing water and creating cooler, moister places on the landscape. This gives plants uh, a better chance to get established and it also provides water for wildlife. Uh, bears are a big fan of hanging out in the puddles that form behind these rock structures. And then we can also work in areas that have lost the diversity of plants, and that was mentioned by Jim and Don, to try to bring back some of the diversity of plants that are really important food for pollinators and other wildlife. And it might seem overwhelming to think about um, how we do this work at the scale of a watershed, but in the work that uh, Sky Island Alliance has done in the Chiricahuas over the course of a two-year project, um, we worked with the Coronado National Forest, Borderlands Restoration Network, and Cuenca Los Ojos Foundation, and dozens of volunteers to install 700 of these structures in two drainages. So it can be done. And back in the Catalinas, uh, something that we've been learning with our work um, looking at springs with volunteers is that springs can be obliterated by fire effects. So they can, erosion can silt them in. And these are very special places on the landscape that both provide water for wildlife and have found to be a refugia, have been found to be a refugia where trees can recover from following high severity fires. There's some examples of this in the Penalino Mountains. So through our Spring Seeker um, program, it's one way for volunteers to get involved and help us understand where springs are, um, their health, and then this information helps us identify where in the mountains to direct uh, protection and restoration activities. So once the Catalinas reopen, we hope some of you can join us in documenting the health of springs following the fire. Great. And lastly, um, as I know you're aware, and I'm sure we all are, in today's economy, we're just seeing you know, ever more budget and staff cuts for our land management agencies. Can you talk about that in the context of your work at the Sky Island Alliance? Yeah, so the Coronado National Forest and other federal land management agencies face a lot of resource limitations that are very challenging when they are working to manage and restore the 1.7 million acres of, of the Coronado National Forest, for example. But they've worked really hard to build partnerships with community organizations to align efforts toward shared goals, which is really wonderful. And we're fortunate in Tucson to live in an amazing community with a diversity of organizations protecting and restoring our natural world. And I think it's important for us as a community to rally around restoration of our beloved mountains and work to resource that restoration by contributing our time, our skills, and when we can, our money. 
So organizations like Borderlands Restoration Network, Watershed Management Group, the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, uh, Save Our Suarez Project, Tucson Audubon, and others are already doing wonderful work in cooperation with the Coronado National Forest. And they and all of you can play a vital role in helping the Santa, Santa Catalina Mountains recover and continue to support diverse wildlife and provide for our quality of life here in Tucson. I know we all want a verdant future for Tucson with flowers for hummingbirds and butterflies and water for jaguars and natural beauty that surrounds us. And we have the community resources to build this verdant future if we stay engaged and, and get our hands dirty out there on the mountain. So thank you for your time and commitment. It's gonna take a whole village. Um, we, we all love the Catalina Mountains and we wanna nurture the new ecosystems that emerge from the Bighorn Fire and I hope you'll join Skyline Alliance and these other wonderful organizations in keeping our home thriving. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, uh, and I know that you'll be hearing from many people on this call, I, I, I imagine. Um, now we're going to turn to questions from our audience. Uh, Don, this question is for you from Betsy Woodhouse. Um, she asks, do the Mexican Sky Islands now look different from ours as a result to the lack of firefighting? Um, if we're hiking down there, how would we know we weren't in the U.S. anymore? Uh, as a matter of fact, Betsy, you don't even have to go into Mexico. You can just go to the sister range of the Catalinas, that is the Rincons. And as most of the people on the call probably know, the Rincons are largely a national park. A national forest. They're managed differently. One way they've been managed differently, which is similar to what we see in Mexico, is that there's been a lighter hand at suppressing fire. And as a result, fire has been allowed to, to play its natural ecological role really for many, many decades in the Rincons. It just so happens there's a fire burning up there right now. Uh, Jim sh shared a picture with uh, of it with me uh, earlier in the day that he that he found on um, the wildland firefighting website. And that fire looks a lot like the kind of historical fire that we would have seen in the Sky Islands and that we still see in Mexico. So it is possible to have this kind of natural fire regime. We have it in the Rincons, a lot of areas in the Gila. And then yes, if you go into big parts of the Sierra Madre and many of the Mexican Sky Islands, especially the areas that are managed by the ejidos, the local collectives, the local economic collectives, they tend to manage with a lighter hand as well and less heavy handed fire suppression. And those forests where we've gone down there to do tree ring work look very uh, evocatively like the old growth forests that we would have seen here a uh, hundred years ago. Great, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Lee Cooper. Hi, Lee. Uh, this question I'll, I'll, I'll address to Louise. Louise, what influences have been introduced by man which negatively impact resilience? Mm -hmm. So Don uh, just mentioned the suppression of fire, which is a big one. It changes the structure of the forest and the makeup of fuels on the mountain, but there's lots of other things in the Catalinas, like the roads that we all use to get to the trailheads we want to, lots of human use of different places. And because of Summer Haven up there um, and human communities, there's a lot of human use of water. So springs have been boxed to be providing water for humans. Um, so that's reducing water available to wildlife. Um, and other, ch other changes like that from human development are compounded then by the climate changes that we mentioned before. Okay, thank you. Um, and now we have a question from Andrea Herr. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, and Jim, this one goes for you. She's asking if there's a website where she can see the vegetation maps that you referred to in your talk. Yes, yeah, you can see those at the website. It's called, I'll just spell it, it's AZ, like in Arizona, azfirescape.org. And, uh, and she could find, you can just it'll have the different mountain ranges and you can go to the Catalinas or you can go to the, the Chiricahuas and find those. Great. Um, Don, I'll address this one back to you again. Um, this question is from Jenny Stern. 
She wants to know, is new growth of this region affected by the increase of temperatures due to climate change, um, let's say two to three degrees over 10 years? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really a great question because when a forest does have a big area of mortality, it's high severity patches, then it has to regrow. And when you're thinking of regrowing, you have to think of seedlings, the seedling stage. It turns out that seedlings have a different climate niche from the, the climate niche that would support uh, uh, mature old growth trees. And when we're saying climate niche, we mean that space defined by uh, growing season temperature and moisture, uh, at soil moisture at different times of the year. Seedlings are much more picky about that. They can't survive, for example, a complete monsoon failure. If they germinate early in the year and then there's no monsoon rain, they don't have the resources to make it through the summer. And in fact, there's a lot of work, not just here in the Southwest, but throughout the interior West on what we're calling recruitment failure. That is after big fires where there are seeds, there are seed source trees, mother trees that are dispersing trees into these areas, but we're not seeing the regrowth. And it turns out that a lot of that is exactly because of the, the, the thrust of your question. And that is the climate is unfavorable for seedling germination and establishment. What do we do about that? We can't go out and water every square acre on a million acre forest. You could do that in a few places. Uh, the Forest Service and the land managing agencies sometimes will go out and plant uh, trees that are already have their roots developed and maybe they'll give them a little bit of water when they start, but they have a little more resource to tough it out during bad periods. But you're absolutely right. This could be a kind of tipping point factor where the forests fail to recover in the way that they would have historically, not because there aren't seeds, because the seeds and the seedlings aren't going to survive. And we're watching this very, very closely. Um, and our next question is, is related to that, um, but I'll bring in Jim to, to address this one um, coming from Greg Garfin. Jim, how might the longevity and or mix of species in these regenerating for forests be affected by climate change, again, such as um, increased temperature? Oh boy, it's so specific to the, the particular ecosystem we're talking about. Let's like take the example of the ponderosa pine that I showed the, at Rustler Park where it was, it was coming back at the, uh, quite quickly. The, uh, now, the conditions were just Right. I mean, this has to get with the seasonality as well with the, with the rainfall. So increased temperatures by themselves are, are not good. The, uh, the I mean, ponderosa pine regeneration is better the, the cooler and more music it is. But it can get hotter and it can get wetter at the same time. The, uh, in fact, I thought that's what would happen this year, but it didn't happen. <laughs> and uh, and so it depends on the mix of the rainfall and the temperature. But in general, the precipitation, the seasonality of it stayed the same. If it got hotter, you're gonna, you're gonna lose those, those ponderosa. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, and this question, uh, I'll throw to, to, to Don, back to you. Um, one viewer wanted to know, are there ways we can manage forests to make these ecosystems resilient to climate change and fire? This is the trillion dollar, hundred million acre question, honestly. That is how we can manage resilient forests going out into the future. And for the, for the, for the time scale of the future, we might think, oh, 2100, that's like way far in the future because for all of us individually as humans, that's you know pretty far out there. For a tree, it may be only 40 or 50 years old by the time it gets to that point if it's originating from one of these fires. That's still a young tree. If we're talking about managing forests, it's almost unthinkable in terms of even climate science, let alone ecology, but we've got to understand the climate three, four, 500 years out before we can say, yes, this is going to be resilient. A few things we do know, certainly the trends are toward uh, increased temperatures, as Jim mentioned. And remember, that's not only the mean annual temperature increase, but it's how the temperature increases during certain key months of the year. 
when there's a lot of sens sensitivity to it. Uh, same with rainfall. Here in the southwest, the prediction is that our winter rains will become weaker and more erratic, at least in some cases because of the displacement of the jet stream. And our monsoon is actually expect expected to remain a monsoon, but possibly with fewer storms and more intense storms. We've seen some of that. On the other hand, right now we've also got uh, cyclones developing in the eastern Pacific off the coast of Mexico. And several of the last few years, we had significant rain during the fall, which has tr traditionally been a, a dry period here for us in the, uh, in the Southwest. But the main thing is to anticipate and accommodate, and I would even say embrace change. And this is really painful as Louise said, because after all the climate, this is not natural climate variability. This is on us. This is our doing. And so we can't simply say, oh, ecosystems are adapting to changing climate just like they always have. Well, it's true, except that we're the ones who are turning the crank on climate change. So it comes with a real kind of knife in the heart that we're having to find a way for ecosystems to be resilient to a stress that we created. But where this leads, and Jim's photography is so evocative on this point, that especially on the scale of many decades, it probably leads to mixes of species that are different from the ones that we would have seen 30 or 40 years ago. So this is the shifting baseline in action, right? So for example, the Catalinas right now, big areas of the Catalinas are dominated by this shrub, Ceanothus buckbrush that Jim mentioned. It's a native, it's doing its thing. It's, it's a perfectly well adapted species, uh, just like gamble oak but it's also very good at tolerating drought. And so we may see our ecosystems, uh, the mix of species in the ecosystems changing towards spe species that are more drought tolerant and maybe could accommodate this different seasonality. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to restore what it was the year before the fire. We absolutely should, because after all, from year to year, conditions haven't changed that much. But remember, most of the forests throughout the Western United States are, they originated during the Little Ice Age, 1400, AD 1400 and on. Of course, there are older stands like the giant sequoias, but most forests we see when we, around the West, and I don't just mean individual trees, but those stands of trees, the forest, are in that four or five, 600 year old range. And that is a very different climate period from the one we're approaching. So. The ultimate answer to this very challenging question is that resilience here means adapting to and possibly embracing and even directing change, which may sometimes be an uncomfortable place for us to be. Um, and you, of course, mentioned uh, the sh the, this concept again of the shifting baseline, which we have another question about um, from a viewer named Aaron. Louise, what do you use as a reference point for restoration when you have a shifting baseline? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, we're um, taking a hard look at climate science to the extent, you know, that we can look at projections and try to understand ways that we can um, conduct restoration to try to provide plants and animals with the best chance possible to respond to the changing conditions. So these, these approaches like keeping uh, moisture in soil and slowing water across the landscape is giving more plants a chance to get to regenerate. Um, but it's, it's really challenging, like, like Don was saying, you know, we can't really look far enough into the future to be perfectly <laughs> constructing um, restoration approaches that respond to that. But there's, there's lots we can do based on what we know about the ecosystem that was there before. And like Don was saying, trying to bring it back to that, which buys um, plants and animals time to adapt to this longer term climate change. Um, but also, yeah, it continues to be really important to understand the drying and the heating that's happening and think about um, a diversity of species when we do native plant installation and really um, any way we can trying to hold that water on the landscape to give them a chance to get established. All right. Well, thank you so much, Louise. Um, that's actually the last question that we have time for this evening. 
Um, those are all great questions and answers. Thank you to our audience and to you, Don, Jim, and Louise. Uh, in our last few minutes this evening, we're going to assemble a final roundtable wrap up discussion again with Dr. Don Falk, who will bring in Dr. Ben Wilder of the Desert Laboratory on Tumamaki Hill, who we heard from at the beginning, and Dr. Laura Marshall, who was a panelist on episode one um, and who's a fire ecology researcher at the University of Arizona. Thank you all for coming back and joining us to talk about some of the overarching themes and issues that have emerged around the Bighorn Fire um, that, uh, you know, it, during this webinar series. Um, the first question I want to address is, is when we're looking at all of the issues and of course the emotions surrounding the Bighorn Fire, it's clear that as a community, um, we really do have a hard time dealing with change. The idea of winding back the clock to what the mountains look like 20 years ago might be appealing, but is that realistic or even achievable? I'll uh, start off with this one and thank you for having me back. I think Don uh, spoke to a lot of this question uh, just, re just before. And really, um, when you're looking back 20 years, particularly in the Catalinas, it's really important to remember that that was a forest that was just vastly out of balance due to the absence of fire. So it was, it was nice, you know, back as a kid walking around Marshall Gulch in the 90s through the dense, deep forest. But that was a deep, dense forest for, you know, a, kind of a bad reason. So it's not necessarily something you want to put back there if we've lost it. And again, as Don mentioned, with the increasing likelihood of recruitment failure from drought and climate change, it you know, might be hard to have a forest at all in some of those areas. Mm -hmm. Ben, anything you want to add? Yeah, well, Laura, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about that figure that you showed um, when your segment in, in episode one, that sh exactly what you were just illustrating there, there was the, uh, well, as far back as the tree rings went, you so pretty frequent fires almost every 10 or so years, and then you got the fire suppression and had pretty much no fires and, and it created the situation you were just describing. I'm thinking, as you, you have shared and other experts on this panel were, we had, I mean, in that you, if you can go back to episode one, see this great figure of uh, all these in the last 20 years, increased fire, large uh, perimeters of these fires, just thinking about the Bullock fire, uh, the Aspen fire, now the Bighorn fire. And, and uh, all of that happened within the last 20 years. I mean, we're, Laura, Doug, can you guys talk a little bit about this stepping back into this high interval frequency of, mm -hmm. of fires and, and just kind of, yeah, what that, what that looks like? Yeah, well, I think um, one way to think of it is that we're making up for that fire deficit all those trees have grown up, all the fuels have stayed on the landscape, and now there's just more opportunity for explosive fire. If Don wants to add anything to that, I'd be welcome. Well, I'll just add that this is where the challenges that are facing our friends and colleagues in, who manage our public lands, our priceless public lands, really have their work cut out for them. You can't just go out with a drip torch and set fire to a forest that's had fire excluded, intentionally excluded for more than a century, what you'll end up with is a conflagration. And so as Laura says, a lot of the forest conditions that we got used to were actually kind of an anomaly created by that fire exclusion. So how do you get back there? Well, you've got to get back there by managing the fuels, especially, and this is work that's really painstaking. It's an acre at a time. In fact, it's a tree at a time, really. And it's expensive and requires a lot of skills. The, the folks who work for the National Park and for the National Forests all over the West have those skills. They know how to do this and they know how to use prescribed fire, but um, they are really challenged for resources and Congress has not given them the resources that they need to do the job. So in theory, we know how, they know how to address, how to get us out of this corner we've painted ourselves in, but it's not gonna be easy and it will really take probably many years, possibly decades of careful work. As we zoom out 
from thinking about the Catalinas or in terms of just our mountain ranges close to Tucson, and you look at, you know, what New Mexico, Colorado is having a lot of fires right now. Is that a really similar situation in terms of a similar um, gap, 70 years or so of very, of a lot of fire suppression, and then now this in high interval going back? Oh gosh, yeah. I mean, the the reasons for it are are different everywhere. The, for example, the t the t the timing of the arrival of the railroad is a really key factor. You had people streaming across the Rocky Mountains and the Great Basin during the gold rush. You have the railroads getting pushed into the uh, interior northwest, um, and of course, remember that as that was happening, this wasn't just a railroad carrying. Um, uh, freight, it was also carrying settlers who were in turn colliding with and excluding the indigenous peoples who had already been pushed around on the landscape enough. And so this period from about 1860 to 1900, we talk about it as a period of fire exclusion, but it's really also very much a period of human, human exclusion. Um, one might also say, call it uh, genocide. I won't maybe go quite that far, but there was certainly no um, uh, consideration given to the role that the indigenous peoples played in maintaining these ecosystems. So there were a lot of things going on that these turning into uh, from natural ecosystems to settled ecosystems, uh, the transportation and the economics, and then the exclusion of people who had been here um, for most of the uh, most of the Holocene. It was a, just a complete type conversion. So that it's you know the, some aspects of that we can get back, but other aspects of it are so pervasive that it's hard to even imagine uh, going back to that kind of time. Uh, a, a major topic of conversation in the early days of the Bighorn Fire, and this really emerged, I think, in, in episode one of this series, was the role of invasive species, um, and in particular, buffalo grass. What are the key takeaway messages from the Bighorn Fire regarding bustle, bubble grass and other invasive species? Yeah, I, I can take a, a first pass at that. Um, I think there's kind of two main points I want to pull out when we think about this. The first is uh, this was a near miss with buffalo grass. So we've been able to do some, um, we have a really solid map of the uh, extent of buffalo grass in the Catalina foothills and we know the fire perimeter. And the fire worked down slope and came just to the kind of the edge, the upper edge of the buffalo grass distribution where the big stands are. And essentially what the, what, what we're seeing is that um, the stands of buffalo grass in the foothills have not coalesced on their upper elevation side yet uh, enough to carry a fire moving down slope. Now, if you change that around and have the fire start lower and work its way up the mountain, it's a very different story. Um, likewise, if you work your way east over to like um, Soldier Canyon is right where the Catalina Highway drives up and leaves the desert, that first big hairpin turn, I'm gonna ruin this view for a lot of you. If you look up that slope um, and you see all that tan brown grass, that's all buffalo grass. So if, a, if the fire was able to work its way further and jump Pontotoc Ridge, it, it then, because the, uh, the crews, the firefighters did an amazing job stopping there. But if it had gone, it would have just exploded up that. And again, that's irreversible uh, ecosystem transformation. The fire, the desert has not evolved with fire. And, and these saguaros are, and much of the other ecosystem is dying. So that's the number one point. We had a near miss and it gives us more time to act and we can control the, the buffalo grass in the Catalina foothills. And just a round number is if we had $10 million over five years, uh, that would be a complete game changer and mm. would allow us to do that. Which sounds like a lot of money, but in the scheme of things for what we're talking about, the fire cost about 44 million to, to fight. Oh, yeah. um, number two is that the ignition point of the fire, that's been talked a lot about. Uh, we were able to work with the Forest Service and to pretty much identify within close proximity where that, this fire, the Bighorn fire started due to lightning strike. And it's up in elevation above where buffalo grass grows. It's in a grassland ecosystem. And that is where you also do have some other invasive species 
uh, layman's love grass. But Ken Franklin spoke about this to us that uh, that's a, a grass that lives in a grassland ecosystem. And so it is, um, it's not a type conversion. You're not transitioning the ecosystem there. And so that's pretty much, uh, I think, important to keep in mind. So invasive species definitely play a role and it, and it changes. And Don, I don't know if you want to mention a little bit about kind of as you work up the mountain, how the, those invasive change. Yeah, so the, what, what Ben is describing is really a huge problem at, among the desert ecosystems because it creates not only an invasive species, it creates an invasive fire regime. Grasses love fire. Grasses and fire have co-evolved for 10 million years. And so um, when you bring grass into a desert ecosystem that never had it, you're not just converting species, you're really converting this fundamental and very powerful ecosystem process. Um, in fact, I, I think it's important to say when there have been several questions and a lot of theme in this webinar about change and accommodating change and looking forward. Um, and we know that there are going to be some replacement of species to be more drought tolerant. But I want to be very, very clear that there's a bright line where we're talking about exotic, exotic invasive species that are these kind of game changers. And that is pretty much off the table for, as in any kind of acceptable future condition, um, anywhere where they are introducing this novel fire regime because it's lethal to everything else that, um, that lives there. So when we look at the space for our desired future conditions, it's sometimes it's easier to think about what's an undesired future condition. There's a lot of different states we could tolerate in middle and upper elevations, well, at all elevations in the Catalinas. But the undesired space is absolutely one that's dominated by these very aggressive non-native species, which are game changers, and pretty much exclude everything else that would be adapted to live there. And uh, I'm going to move our conversation along. So, Don, you, of course, mentioned climate change. Um, how did how did climate change play a role in this uh, bighorn fire? And let's take a step back and talk about what we can do locally and globally to tackle climate change. Yeah. So um, uh, it's kind of a paradox. On one hand, it's generally very difficult to attribute any event, any single event, whether it's a fire or a hurricane or a tornado or a monsoon storm or anything like that to climate change because there's a lot of variability from year to year in how climate ex is expressed globally. So we can't necessarily say with uh, definitively that was a climate change fire. But what we look for are changes in what's called the fire regime. And the fire regime is the properties of multiple fires looked at over, say, 10 or 20 years and maybe a big two-state area like the southwest or the southwestern U.S. states and the northern states of Mexico. So you take a longer look over space and time, and that's when you can see the difference, the changes in the, in the fire regime. And from that perspective, the Bighorn Fire is absolutely consistent with fires that are showing the unmistakable signature of climate change. It started earlier. The temperatures were unusually hot, dry. Of course, we've always had that hot, dry fire season. Uh, but as we saw in the first uh, webinar in this series, this wonderful series, the climate was definitely way at the edge of the distribution. Uh, if you look at the um, I want to jump in there because you're you're painting a picture that I think is really interesting. So one of the things that I've been grappling with, and this was a question that was posed early on to the in, during the fire, is was this fire good or bad? And and Laura, your work has made me think a lot about that in terms of the regenerations of the pines, but the fire into. I mean, where Laura, what would you say? I mean, that's such a simplistic question, but I think it's important as a takeaway. Yeah, I think it is important. It's kind of hard to judge the whole yet without seeing kind of the longer term effects. Uh, trees can, you know, survive or die for years after a fire. Uh, and we won't see any regeneration effects for another year easily. So really, um, and we're considering, if you're considering just on, you know, the scale of like day to day, I, I could say that there were good days and there were bad days in the fire. Like, um, 
and kind of going back to climate change, when we had that really crazy late, late wind event, uh, which can be caused by kind of destabilization of the jet stream, uh, which also leads to kind of increased highs and low temperature extremes. Uh, so if that was at all climate change related, it could have pushed, you know, more of a bad effect on the mountain in terms of fire, uh, fire effects. So but, when, when, when my dog Stanley digs holes in our backyard, he's a bad dog. When he curls up at my feet, he's a good dog. And so he has his moments and fires are really the same way. Here's an interesting fact that is not what you would see in the evening news. Large wildfires are usually typically 50 to 80% low and moderate severity. They create what's called a mosaic of burn severity. You can have unburned patches right next to a place that got torched, sometimes really, really close proximity. And that spatial land mosaic, as we were saying earlier, is really important to how the forest recovers. But it is also true that wildfires uh, historically probably had that same mix. And there's a lot of evidence that the area, the proportion of burned area that's in high severity may be increasing. But even that is a subtle trend because the fires are getting bigger in the last 20 to 30 years. And so you have to account for that. So, you know, if we want to say this was a good fire or a bad fire, and I would say it was a highly mixed fire like most big wildfires. And we should look at the reset, the kind of forest reset that happens when you have those high severity patches, the kinds of things that Laura studies in her research, which is how do seedlings and saplings deal with the, the new conditions after a wildfire. That is a completely natural process. And so I don't want to make light of the fact that we lost old growth forest, which we really should not have. And I'm, I'm grieving about it more than I can really speak here. But it's also true that that reset is very much why what gives us the forest that we have. It's just that here it happened right in front of us when we could watch and, and see it. And so I agree with Laura that we would really have to wait, you know, probably decades before we could say, um, before we could judge the quality of this fire. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Don, Ben, Laura, thank you so much for all of your insights. And that brings us to the end of this webinar series, Fire on the Mountain. This episode was recorded and will be posted in about a day along with episodes one and two. Um, you can access those recordings and resources, some of which were mentioned tonight for getting involved with local restoration and monitoring eff efforts. And of course, with um, global climate change efforts at www.environment.arizona.edu backslash fire on the mountain. I wanna thank you all for watching and wish you a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks so much.